of a conundrum, which I will be announcing once Professor Stoichu agrees. Uh, based on the fact that there's a lot of self clock references to it, I can't imagine he would say no to it. Uh, I will also give you part of the midterm to do as homework problems, not as part of the 24 hours. So like what? So you'll have some of the problems to do. It'll be like a homework assignment rather than giving you homework problems to work on the week you have the midterm. So like that problem will be part of the problem? Yes. So, so I'll split the exam into parts. Okay. So rather than doing additional homework problems while taking the midterm, the homework problems will actually just be the midterm. But you have the whole week to do it. But you have the whole week to do it. But those homework problems don't count towards the 24 plus 6 hours. And are those homework problems individual or? Okay. Individual. So, is the homework entirely consistent of the problems that we have through the midterm, or are there additional problems on top of this? Uh, now there will be, no. <laughs> there may be some minor additional thing, but for the most part, it will just be some of the more standard problems. Okay. So, weak law of large numbers. What do you think is a better result than the weak law of large numbers? Strong. The strong law of logic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Everyone has done a good job yeah. here. Yes? Why do you think we talk about the weak law and as opposed to just go straight to the strong law? It makes us feel better. It has less conditions. It has less conditions. What else? It's more general. So it'll be a little bit more general, which is related to less conditions. What else? Easier to prove. Right? This is also related to a little bit of the more generality. Okay? So the question is talking about how do things converge? What are the different ways of talking about convergence? <laughs> so there's four different types of convergence. And what's really nice is different people have different names for the same type of convergence. Uh, there may be an advanced course in probability next year. We're not sure. We're still trying to decide what to do. We have decided to have courses next year. We know that much. We will hopefully know by Wednesday slash Thursday whether or not there will be a stats meeting. So, so fingers crossed. If anybody is interested in going to graduate school in stats, please let me know. I was talking to a couple of people at a conference. Even if you've taken no stats, they will still accept William students. You're just that good, yes. I put my reputation on the line. I talked to them about you and yes, we'll take them. They don't need any stats. We will teach them the stats. Yes. And so next, starting next year, this is the last time this class will not be co-listed with stats. Oh, I know. So, can somebody tell me what the weak law of large numbers studies? <laughs> not necessarily, unfortunately. I'm trying to think. Yes, I, I will not take up an eighth of an M&M &M for that one, but... Yes. N factorial for really large ends. No. What's, what's N factorial for really large ends? No, what studies n factorial for really large n? Gamma. Stirling's formula. That's Stirling's formula. So we study, say, xi, iid, rv. We can let x bar equal x1 plus xn divided by n. It's the average value. And let's say it has finite mean mu. If I don't have finite means, it is hard to study a lot of these things. There is something you can do if you do not have a finite mean. You can use what's called the median. And we'll talk a little bit about the median later in the semester. It's the point where half the probability is before and half the probability is after. The median is not always well defined. Sometimes you can have multiple medians for distribution. But what's nice is that the median exists in situations where the mean does not. Because you're just talking about the cumulative distribution, where's the halfway point? Whereas for the mean, you need a certain integral to be finite. And those integrals are not always finite. So can anybody tell me anything about x bar as n gets large? <coughs> What's the first things we should be asking? Yes? What's the variance that sort of... Okay, I would say that's the second thing. So the variance of x bar, the variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. So this is going to be the sum, k goes from 1 to n, of the variance of 1 over n times xk. 
I've got to be very careful because if you multiply a random variable by five, how much does the variance change by? Five. No. Twenty-five. The standard deviation changes by five. If I rescale my units by a factor of five, then the standard deviation scales by five, but the variance by twenty-five. So since I have a one over n, the variance of that when I pull out the one over n, it becomes one over n squared. But how many of these do I have? I have n. So n divided by n squared is 1 over n. So this would just be the variance of any of the xi's divided by n. <coughs> Bless you. What can we say about that? If what's true. So this is how we get conditions. We try to do something and then realize that we need a little <coughs> bit more. So you're absolutely right. This looks like it wants to go to zero. What's the only way this won't go to zero? Yeah, the variance is infinite. So we can see we want to assume something else. You know, assume variance is a finite. You know, sigma squared less than infinity. Now we get the variance of x bar goes to zero. And in fact, we even have an idea of how rapidly it goes to zero. It goes to zero like 1 over n. OK, so I said variance of x bar was the second thing we should look at. What's the first thing we should look at? The mean. So what will the mean of x bar be? You wrote the variance. Ah. <laughs> I just really like the variance. Nah. I'm just hardwired that the second thing we're looking at is the variance. So <laughs> what should the expected value of x bar look like? So again, I'll have the sum k goes from 1 to n of the expected value of x, well, wait, the same as the variance, 1 over n times xk. But now I have for the expected value, expected value is linear. So I pull out the 1 over n, I have n of them, they cancel, and I just get the expected value of any one of them. Well, they all have the same expected value. So what we're seeing is that if we look at the average value, the expected value or the mean of the average value is exactly what you would want. It's the expected value of the underlying population, and its variance is tending to zero. So what this means is as n gets larger and larger and larger, the value of the mean is more <coughs> tightly concentrated about the true value. There's a situation which will happen in this class in about a week where I will be trying to measure something. What will I be trying to measure? Grades. Yeah. And you know, how well do you know the material? What can I do to get a really good sense of how well you know the material? You have a lot of problems, right? <laughs> the more problems I give you, the more accurately I can measure your mean. Right? Sure. So again, when you're taking the exam, just remember, this is to get an accurate measurement. Okay? Now, what can I do to get a really accurate measurement? Instead of doing a 24-hour exam, constant testing, right? Non-stop, 24-7, <laughs> right? <laughs> I figure I have enough problems already to get a pretty good estimate of what you're doing, but it's not going to be a perfect estimate. There will be variance. If I could ask you 50 questions of all different levels, it would be great. How many of you have taken dynamic tests now, where you're doing these online tests, maybe GREs or SATs, and the questions you're asked are a function of how well you answer the earlier questions? So what they, they're awful now, because if you make a mistake in the beginning, you can get trapped in the computer thinking you're a moron. It's really, hard. It's, it's really hard to work out from a mistake in the beginning. And there's only so many questions they can ask you, and so they're trying to figure out what's the best way to get a true assessment of your ability. Which question should they ask you? How much should the different questions be worth? So we have here all the things we need for a weak law of large numbers. We know that the sample mean, so sample mean is converging to the population or the true mean. And we have some idea about how quickly. So what we can do is we can quantify. So whose theorem do you think will be useful to quantify the rate of convergence? <coughs> so 
So looking at the setup we have, whose theorem should we be looking at? Any thoughts? What information do we know? We know the mean, we know variance. So given those two inputs, whose theorem should you use, knowing mean and knowing variance? Chevy Shabby, Shabby, right? Chevy Shabby, why aren't we using Markov? Because I looked at my notes and Chevy Shabby had the... <laughs> so Chevy Shabby, Shabby has mean, Chevy Shabby has variance, but why not Markov? I'm telling you, why not Markov? Markov doesn't involve variance. Markov doesn't use the variance information, so we know more information than Markov. Markov also has conditions on when we can apply it. We need our, our random variable to be non-negative. And that may not be the case over here. So we can use Chebyshev. So the probability that x bar minus mu <coughs> is greater than or equal to k sigma, and I'm going to write x bar to remind ourselves that it's the variance or the standard deviation of the sample mean that comes into play. This is less than or equal to what? 1 over k squared. Now what's nice is sigma x bar is tending to zero. So what I could do is I could say, what is the probability that x bar minus mu is greater than or equal to epsilon? So I could fix a very small epsilon and I want to know what's the probability. How would I figure this out? It's just you have k equal to epsilon over sigma. So k would just be epsilon over sigma bar. So <coughs> we fix epsilon, k will then be epsilon divided by sigma x bar, but sigma x bar is going to be sigma divided by square root of n. <coughs> so we get epsilon uh, root n over sigma. Is k big or small? So I fixed epsilon, letting n go to infinity. You should really think of this as k sub n. Is this a large number or a small number? Large. If you fixed epsilon, and you're letting n go to infinity, to be epsilon away from the mean, that's a lot of standard deviations. The natural scale to measure things is like 1 over square root of n. If epsilon is like 10 to the negative 4, that's a small number. But when n is enormous, I have to do a huge number of standard deviations to get up to 10 to the negative 4. k is going to be a huge number. So this is going to be 1 over k squared. So I'll get uh, epsilon squared n sigma squared. <coughs> and so even if epsilon is a really small number, as n goes to infinity, this tends to 0. And so this is the weak law. So a fixed epsilon tends to zero as n goes to infinity. So the sample mean becomes a really good approximation of the true mean of the population. So if you take a statistics class, this is one of the things you want to be able to do. You want to estimate the values of you know, the parameters of your distribution. They model something in the real world, you gather data, you want to figure out what it is. In baseball, maybe we're trying to figure out uh, how productive a team is. How many runs are they scoring? Maybe we want to figure out uh, household income. We start gathering some data and we try to figure out what is the true value given our observations. <coughs> the more observations you have, the better job you'll do. So why don't we just keep taking more observations? It's costly. It's costly. <coughs> and you can start to ask, how much of a gain are you getting from each additional observation? And so if you have 100 observations and you go to 200, that's pretty good. If you have 1,000 and go up to 1,100, 
you've increased by the same amount, but the effect is much less. So to keep increasing your accuracy, the more data you have, not surprisingly, the more observations you need, but the more data you have, the more comfortable you are with the value you have. All right. This is all I want to talk about in terms of distributions and you know, types of convergence in the class for now. There's other types here that in the book I want you to be aware of them, but you know, for the first for the first course, this is what we'll talk about until we get to the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem will give us a much better rate on convergence for something like this. And so we saw this with Chebyshev when we looked at the Laplace distribution, which is the two-sided exponential. We saw that you know Chebyshev greatly overestimated. I think Chebyshev was giving us like 0.02. And the real answer was 0 0.0000, 000, maybe one more zero, five. You know, so Chebyshev overestimates. Uh, how many of you have been in an elevator? Okay, what am I thinking about? In terms of overestimating, maybe? Weight limits. Yeah, weight limits. I've always wondered, you know, how do they figure out exactly how much they can put in the elevator? What issue do you have if you make a mistake in estimating the weight of an elevator, its capacity? People die, right? Mentioned small. Which kind of mistake is better to make in an elevator? Overestimating <laughs> how many people can go in? No. No. Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is one of the reasons why Williams typically does not have elevators in buildings. I'm not everybody has taken. Okay, overestimating the amount of weight that can go in. They'll break it. So if you say Maybe the elevator can. I'll be very careful. So let's say the elevator can survive with 2,000 pounds, and you say it can survive with 2,500 pounds. Is that a good way to make the error or the bad way to make an error? Uh, bad uh, way. It would be much better for you to say the elevator can only take 1,500 pounds. And yes, you could have done more, but this way you can protect yourself. So when you're trying to make mistakes, there are a lot of times in the real world where certain types of mistakes are more costly than others. And you deliberately err one way rather than another. You don't necessarily want symmetric errors. Okay. And it becomes a very interesting situation. Because what could happen is you could have a lot of people waiting to use the elevator. And this could be bad. Uh, probably not elevators. There's not that many people. Where do you think this might come into play? Um, like, like the number of people that are expected to fit inside a room, like maximum room occupancy in the event of a fire. In the event of a fire. That's what's so where's my map? Uh -huh. So yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's you know, fire, you know, how many people can you have in a room safely? And you know, every now and then you do read about these tragic situations where there's a bar or a restaurant and you know, there's been a fire and there's a mad rush of people trying to get out. And if you have too many people, there are issues. Uh, weight limits on bridges. You know, again, that's another situation where it's very expensive to have to make a new bridge. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're now coming to Sterling's formula. I could easily spend, I think, an entire week talking about all the different ways to estimate Sterling's formula and all the great things we can get from it. I'll try to confine myself to just maybe a day and a half. But there's far more that you can read about in the book. There's a lot of really good techniques here. So does anybody remember um, n large, um, n factorial is approximately what? Anybody remember? This formula should be hardwired if you're going to stay in mathematics. n to the n, e to the minus n, square root of 2 pi n, and then it's 1 plus, to the plus or minus 1 over 12 n, something that's getting much, much smaller. <coughs> it's worth staring at this for a bit. If n is huge, n to the n kills e to the minus n. Think of this as n over e to the n. If I multiply n over e to the n by 1 over n or 1 over 12 n, is it still a large number? On an absolute scale, this secondary term is still large, right? It's just small relative to the main term. The main term is so big that the secondary term is very small relative to it. But in an absolute sense, it's still very, very large. How many of you would like a quadrillion dollars in cash right now? 
What if I tell you you're going to have to pay a trillion dollars in taxes if I give you a quadrillion dollars? Yes. Yes. Right? You should not care. Right? You'll even pay ten trillion dollars in taxes. You don't mind. You're getting a quadrillion dollars. Okay? So even though on an absolute scale a trillion dollars is a large amount to be hit, relative to the main term, absolutely no problem. Sadly, uh, it would be noticeable, but the debt would still be extremely high. Uh, anybody know how big the debt is? Fourteen. Oh. Higher than fourteen. Well, I don't think so. No, no, it's not that much higher. No, it's not that much higher than fourteen. Because we're running, because like, the deficit we're running is like very much like a trillion. The debt right. is around fourteen. The debt is around fourteen. I think it's a little higher than fourteen, but it's around fourteen. Uh, the debt is now greater than GDP. So what that means is if we decide to basically starve ourselves for an entire year, that is not enough to pay things off. So we really do need somebody to get a quadrillion dollars. So, you know, homework assignment, extra credit, A in the class, you know, get a quadrillion dollars and pay a trillion dollars in taxes. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are not able to do that extra credit assignment, I will continue with the lecture which will help you get points on exams. Right? There are lots of ways to prove Sterling's formula. If you want, I can jump to an, a quick proof or I can go through first some ways to try to estimate what we think the answer should be. Do you want to build intuition first, or do you want to jump to the punchline? Build intuition. Build intuition. All right. So let's build some intuition. Can somebody give me an upper bound for n factorial? I don't care how bad it is. I just want a bound. I'm sorry? N factorial plus one? <laughs> Come on, that at least is an eighth of an M&M deduction. I, I would say that is a seventh of an M&M deduction. Yes. N to the N. N to the N. That's worth an M&M. &M. N to the N is a good one. But now I'll accept a lower bound from you, so you can earn it back. A lower bound for N factorial. Other than zero. <laughs> n. That's a great lower bound. So we know that n factorial lives somewhere between n and n to the n. Right? It's a very big range. So the question is, can we narrow it down a little bit more? And when you have problems like this, one thing that's really good is to try to understand where things vary and where things are the same. So n factorial, I'm multiplying a lot of numbers together. When are numbers approximately the same? When are numbers approximately different? <coughs> Can somebody give me examples of numbers that are about the same? I'm sorry? A million and a million plus one. Yeah, a million and a million plus one have basically the same contribution. Give me, two, give me other numbers that have approximately the same contribution. Two and three. Two and three. Now, of course, when you're really small, there's a huge difference between 2 and 3, but they're both small, and so we'll, we'll amalgamate them and group them together. So here's a really good way to study n factorial. 1, 2, 3, and I'm, I'm not going to really worry about, you know, is n halves an integer or not. Maybe we can assume if we want n is even. n halves plus 1, all the way up to n. So here's n factorial. <coughs> How can I approximate each number here? And you'll tell me if this is going to give me an upper bound or a lower bound. What's a way to get an upper bound for each term? N. N. So upper would be N, and how many terms do I have? N over two. N over two. And what about a lower bound? <coughs> I'm sorry? N over 2 plus 1. Uh, okay, N over 2 to the N over 2. And so notice, this is N to the N halves times 1 half to the N halves. So this gives you a sense of how they differ. I, what about the stuff in the beginning over here? How can I approximate these? You know, upper bound and lower bound again. 
So the upper bound would be n halves to the n halves, and the lower bound, 1. Is equation on the left, are we assuming it's greater than 0? Or uh, the double division part? Because 0 would not. Yeah. Okay. Now, if n equals 0, then the question is how do we interpret 0 to the 0? And in this case, the correct interpretation of 0 to the 0 is 1. So it's very interesting. You know, if you raise anything to the 0th power, you get 1. But 0 to any power is 0. So it's an interesting conflict. You know, it's, um, any Star Trek fans here? Any G.I. Joe fans? <laughs> what happens if G.I. Joe joins Starfleet? Nobody in G.I. Joe dies. But on away missions in Star Trek, yeah. Ensign Red Shirt usually does not make it to two episodes. <laughs> so what would happen if G.I. Joe joined Starfleet and went on an away mission with Kirk, Spock, and McCoy wearing a red shirt? It's this, you know, that's what zero to the zeros. It's that kind of conflict. <laughs> <laughs> it's at that level. <laughs> Wasn't it that one guy in the red shirt who didn't die? Um, it was like one actor who wore the red shirt. My favorite is they beam down to a planet once, and the ensign goes, "A oh, Klingon!" and he pulls out his phaser, and then the aliens nunchuck him and he dies. And you know, you know, Kirk is like, you know, he's kind of upset. You know, he was so young and inexperienced. <laughs> And they said, well, that he shouldn't really be on the planet now, should he? <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> and so similar to moving on in Star Trek, now what can you tell me about the up and the lower bounds? If we combine, you get the upper bound is just going to be n halves to the n halves times n to the n halves. Let's see what we get. n halves to the n halves is n to the n. And then we have 2 to the negative n halves. How can I write 2 to the negative n halves? 2 to the 2 over 1. No. I want a good way to write this. So I have divided by 2 to the n halves. And I think <coughs> there's a better way of writing 2 to the n halves. Yes? 2 to the 2 over 1. Two, 2 to the what? Yeah. You, is that... I want to rewrite 2 to the n halves uh, in a way that looks more like Sterling. Root 2 to the n. Excellent. Root 2 to the n. What do we have in Sterling? We have n to the n, e to the minus n. So if you want, I could write this as square root of 2 to the negative n. So rather than having an e to the minus n, I have a root 2 to the minus n. I root 2 is about 1.4, e is about 2.71. So again, I'm missing by a lot, but this is much better than the n to the n. I'm not going to really worry too much about my lower bound. Lower bounds will shift from upper bounds by a little bit. So this isn't so bad. But <coughs> what can I do to do better? You can keep dividing. Keep house. dividing. So this is called dyadic decompositions. So what I'm doing is I'm basically dividing my set into half, then I'll divide in half again and again and again. Now of course, if n is a power of 2, this is a lot easier to do. But you know, you can you know, do some bookkeeping. And this is a really powerful technique, and this is the reason I wanted to go through this. You know, again, this does not give as good of a bound as Sterling. It approaches Sterling, and you can see how close we can get, but there's a really good idea here. And that's what I want to emphasize. That's one of the big themes of this course, is trying to emphasize how do you attack something. The other thing is to just see how far you can go elementarily. It's a little bit of a challenge. And again, you either like these games or you don't. I like these games. I have nothing against calculus. I'm a big fan of calculus. I have nothing against complex analysis. Uh, some of my favorite classes this semester are complex analysis. And I will actually be doing the gamma function using complex analysis later in the semester. And so I'll make those videos you know, available. And not surprisingly, using techniques from complex analysis, you can do a lot better. But it's interesting to see, if I just count on my fingers, how well can I do? So let's do one more counting. And so we're going to break it up a little bit more. So rather than going up to n halves, I go up to what? n quarters, n quarters plus 1, 
to n halves, n halves plus 1 all the way up to 3n over 4, 3n over 4 plus 1 all the way up to n. And I'll only worry about upper bounds. Okay. So, in the first one, what's my upper bound? N over 4 to the n over 4. N over 4 to the n over 4. The next one is n halves. And I'm going to write it uh, 2n over 4 to the n over 4. Over here, I'll write it as 3n over 4 to the n fourths. And over here, I'll write it as n to the n fourths. And I multiply them all together. What's going to be my power of n? <coughs> so I'll have n to the n quarters plus n quarters plus n quarters plus n quarters. I'm going to get n to the n. And now I'll have 1 fourth times 2 fourths times 3 fourths to the n fourths. Okay. So what I have here is, let's see, a 2 cancels down here. That gives me a 2. I have 3 30 seconds. So this is going to be n to the n and then... Uh, 32 over 3, take the fourth root of that to the negative nth power. So, does somebody have a calculator to quickly figure that out? <clears throat> Let's see how close we are to. I have to keep hitting the advanced panel every time I want to do anything on trivial. All right, what did people get? I got 1.8. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> All right. Assuming I've done. This is why we're not history class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't know what my. Don't use this one. I think I get about 1.807. I got 1.807 also. Alright, you can have the answer. <laughs> so we had 1.414 before. Now we got up to 1.807. We're trying to get to 2.718. Already, with just four little pieces like this, it's not horrible. And then the question is, well, what happened in the limit? In the limit, will we get to Sterling? Well, we're making remarkable progress. Okay? Let's do one more. Is everybody comfortable with these two? All right, I, I want to use a result from calculus, but you don't need calculus to do this. How many of you know the Farmer-Brown problem? It's almost always Farmer-Brown. Sometimes they call him Bob, but that's wrong. It's supposed to be Farmer-Brown. What shape does Farmer-Brown love? No. <laughs> Square. Rectangles. He loves rectangles. He will only consider rectangular pens for his cattle. <coughs> and he has so many meters of fence. And what is the maximum amount of... Right? How many of you remember you know, the Farmer Brown problem? You have 40 meters of fence, and you find out that the best you can do is to make a square. <laughs> so Farmer Bob is Farmer Brown's... A uh, brother or cousin, and he lives either at the base of a mountain or by a river, and he doesn't need to use fence on one side. Right? Do you know how to, as an aside, do you know how to quickly solve the Farmer Brown problem knowing the Farmer, I'm sorry, the Farmer Bob problem knowing the Farmer Brown problem? So, Farmer Brown, when you have to do the whole rectangle, you want to do a square. Do you know how to do the Farmer Bob problem immediately? 
So this is where you, know, you have, say, water over here, and you want to figure out what's the best way. So does anybody know what the answer is? That's correct. I still want to do a zero. Oh. Well, but no, 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 because now you don't have to do any fence on the side because you have the water. Yeah, but it's square with, um, I'm sorry? This is square with different length sides. We used to have that. <laughs> uh, the square with different length sides is known as a rectangle. No. <laughs> right, right. So let's say you have 40 meters not, of fence. No, if you have 40, if you have 40 meters of fence, what would you do? What would be not, the dimensions if you have 40 meters of fence? Of no. I'm sorry? But still making a square the long side is twice as long. So the long side is twice as long. Yeah. So this is what you would get in the Fama ball problem. So the solution to the Fama uh, ball problem, to do it quickly, is Aquaman. Okay? Aquaman is swimming in the ocean, and he is going to build a pen for his fish. Uh. And so whatever Fama Bob does, whatever's best on land is also best at sea. <laughs> so they now have twice as much fence to work with. So since the optimal is a square, it's going to just be half of a square. So you can actually get Farmer Bob by symmetry if you really understand what Farmer Brown is doing. Okay? Why am I talking about this here? I'm trying to maximize x times y given x plus y is fixed. I claim this has some connection to what we're doing with Sterling. Anybody see the connection? Trying to maximize the product of the terms we get, given that they will sum to n. Something along those lines, yeah. Or one. And so, <coughs> let, let's start off simply and <coughs> go from there. So, 1, 2, and n plus 1 dot n. I can match things in pairs. Right? And if I have n plus 1 matched with n, let's, let's put in a couple more terms. n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3. So oh, so this would be n hands. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, this is where it would be easy to actually work with 2n rather than n, but then I go all the way down, and here I have n, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3. The sum of these two is the same as the sum of these two is the same as the sum of these two is the same as the sum of these two. They all have the same sum. Right? If they all have the same sum, when is the product largest? N over 2 in the, the near term. Not N over 2, unfortunately, but we have things to find. <clears throat> N over 2 plus 1. Not N over 2 plus 1. Because we're going from N over 2 plus 1 to N. So which pair is going to have the largest oh, product? Right. Oh, okay. the, the, the middle one, which is 3N yeah. over 4. <clears throat> right? I have two things that have a fixed sum. I want to maximize the product. The product is maximized at the middle. So rather than replacing this with n, and this with n, and this with n, let's take these two together and replace them with 3n over 4 squared. Because the product of the two of those will be less than or equal to that. And if I wanted a lower bound, I would replace all the products with the extreme one, n halves plus 1 times n. And that's how I would get my lower bound. So what I have here now is in all of these, I'm going to get... 3n over 4 squared, and how many times do I have it? n over 2. n over 2. So that's going to be the 2 cancels. I get 3n over 4 to the n. really scary. Do you want a plus 1? No, no, I don't want a plus one. I just want. Um... Oh, you know, I, I have n over four things, right? I have n halves numbers, and each pair has two oh. numbers in it. So I would have three n over four to the n halves. If I look at what's going on over here, 
the middle one is going to be, you know, 2n over 4. I square it, and I have it n fourth times, so that would be 2n over 4 to the n halves. And so now my upper bound All right, so I get 2n over 4 to the n halves, 3n over 4 to the n halves. Okay, again, I still have n to the n. And now I have 1 half times 3 fourths, so that's going to be 3 sixteenths, or 16 thirds when I flip it. Um, and I have to take the square root, and I take that to the negative nth power. One half times three fourths is three sixteenths. I'm sorry? We have one half. Oh, I think it should be eight, maybe? Eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight, eight thirds. Yeah, eight thirds. Okay. So, okay, so I need square root of eight thirds. So this is two root two over three. Um, it's not going to be a great number. 1.633. All right. 1.633. Yep. <clears throat> the very first time we did it, we got square root of 2 when we split things in half. We got 1.414 to the negative n. We're getting 1.633 to the negative n. That's not bad. Let's do it one more time. So rather than splitting, splitting it into halves, let's split it into fourths and see how well we do. Okay. Any questions on what we had over here? So let's look and see what do we get if we do it now in fourths. So in the first one, we have from 1 to basically n fourths, then n fourths to <coughs> n halves, then n halves to 3n over 4, and then 3n over 4 to n. So in this regime, I'm going to get n eighths squared, <coughs> and then the number of pairs I have is n eighths, In this regime, I'll have, uh, so my middle point is going to be uh, 3 eighths, I think. It will be 3n over 8 squared to the n eighths. Over here, it'll be 5n over 8 squared to the n eighths. And over here, it'll be 7n over 8 squared to the n eighths. Alright, and so we have n to the n as always. And now the squares is going to make everything come in as n to the fourths. And so we'll have 1 eighth times 3 eighths times 5 eighths times 7 eighths. We want to take this to the 1 fourth power, and then we'll take the square root of it. I mean, we'll take it to the uh, <coughs> negative nth power, right? Because all the twos make these n fourths, and so we're left with n to the n. Uh, so we have eight to the fourth divided by uh, what? It's three times five times seven is one hundred five. So we take the fourth root of all this. Oh, what's the fourth root of eight? Uh, the fourth root of eight to the fourth? Eight. eight. So we'll have eight divided by the fourth root of 105 to the negative n. Alright. Does somebody have the fourth root? Wait, the fourth root of one over 105? It's eight divided by the fourth root of 105. Oh, yeah. Uh, 2.499. Wow! What was this? 2.499. 2.499. Right. This should give you a sense of the power of elementary arguments. In just two iterations, we got to 2.499. We almost got 2.5. That's not bad. If we were to do even one or two more iterations, we would get really close to E. So the question is, how far can you push this? Can you actually make this into a proof of Sterling?
And of course, <coughs> there's, a, there's a similar corresponding problem that we've not talked about that we should be talking about as well. We've only been calculating what? Upper bound. Upper bounds. So we really want to know, well, what's the lower bound? How much is this you know, missing by? And so it's a good exercise to do the lower bounds, but essentially you can almost get the lower bounds by just shifting things a bit. Yes? So why do we flip the numerator and denominator? Because we want to write things, Stirling's formula says we have n to the n, e to the negative n. Okay. So I want to have something to the negative nth power. Okay, I think we had negative Oh, yeah. yeah that. Oh, sorry, that should be a positive <laughs> n here. Yes, thank you. So I've now lost an eighth of an M&M &M and you've gained one. <laughs> I, so again, you either, you either like stuff like this or you don't. As you can probably tell, I really like arguments along these lines. I think it's absolutely amazing how close you can get with how little work. This is a really nice example of why you care about the farmer Brown problem. Okay? Most of you, now this is William, so there is a chance you could have some involvement with cows. But for the most part, people typically do not have much involvement with cows. Yes? I have one named after me. You have one named after you? Can you bring in a picture? <laughs> it looks like I can take one. Okay. I'd like to. Yeah, please. <laughs> one of the Harvard newspapers, I forget if it was the Lampoon or the Crimson, uh, put a cow in Harvard Yard with a sign on it, property of so and so, prof of Professor So and so. And Harvard is an old enough institution that certain professorships have some strange perks including the right to have their cattle grazing in Harvard Yard. <laughs> and so it's a really nice uh, use of uh, cows in an academic setting. For the most part, you're not going to use cows, okay? You know, once you're done, uh, William's cow chipping will be a thing of the past. But this idea of grouping things together, that's worth remembering. And seeing, you know, when can I use this? Well, I know if I have a fixed sum, the product is maximized when they're as close to each other as possible. And so a nice consequence of that was to get a really good bound towards Stirling. All right, so I'm not going to go through more stuff in terms of how much further we could push this. Uh, if you want to, you know, by all means, I strongly encourage you to keep reading the book. I think I have three different sections on elementary approaches to Stirling. On Wednesday's class, we're going to prove Stirling the more natural, the more standard way. And so I'm going to just end with, I want you to have a Pavlovian response. So what should you be saying? There's only three acceptable answers. I've warned you I want a Pavlovian response. What should you be thinking? Take the log. Take the log. I haven't even written anything on the board. If it wasn't the log, it would either be adding zero or multiplying by one. But whenever you see a product, you should be thinking logs. In Stirling's formula, does anybody see a product anywhere? Hmm. Right? So if we study the log of n factorial, this is the log of 1 plus the log of 2 plus the log of n. What does this look like? My son was upset that when he went to school, people mistook his Halloween costume of the train as a robot. This should not be mistaken. When you see something like this, what does this look like? Alright, so it looks like a sum. What do sums like this look like? When you, when you see a sum like this, what do you want to replace it with? An integral. And we'll have to figure out exactly what the bounds of integration are. But when you see sums like that, you should be thinking integrals. And so this is now a powerful way to get towards Stirling is to replace these sums with integrals and then actually quantify how much our error is. I'm going to assume most of you have either never learned or have forgotten your series and sequences and stuff, and so I will just review all that stuff on Wednesday because that is good stuff to